busy diaries and we're really grateful that you made the time today to join us at this webinar. So um, just to introduce myself, my name is Dr. Kutika Pal. I am uh, the Deputy CEO and the Director of Children's Services at Starlight. And we're going to have a short presentation by my very good colleague, Sandy, uh, who is the Head of Impact and Insight at Starlight, who's going to share the key findings of the report. And then we are very, very fortunate to have um, two of our, um, what I would like to think are, are friends of Starlight, um, Alison Tonkin um, from Stanmore College, and Kath Evans from Bart's Health, who are going to share their reflections on the report. And I'm really looking forward to hearing their thoughts um, about the, the piece of work that's been published today. And then there will be plenty of time for a Q&A session with the panel, with Sandy and Alison and Kath. Um, so there's lots of opportunity for your questions. So please uh, make a note of things that you want to ask. And um, I will be asking you to either raise your hand or put a question in chat. And I hope that we have a really good discussion this afternoon. So I'm now going to hand over to Sandy, please. Thank you, Kritika. Um, If you could have the next slide, please. Go one back. <laughs> um, so, in case you found yourself in this webinar and are wondering who Starlight is, um, we are the UK's uh, charity for children's play in healthcare. And we use the power of play to transform children's experience of uh, healthcare treatment and illness. We do this by delivering services either directly to healthcare settings, and you will find out in this uh, presentation we are in around 95% of all acute trusts and health boards. Um, but we also use our voice uh, and uh, in our policy and public affairs function to lobby others and influence others to protect play for children and young people. And everything we do is evidence based. Um, and um, and this is why we're, to be, uh, we've, we're speaking to you today, because we are launching our uh, report for Plain Hospital Week. We do this every year and we want to talk to you, if we could have the next slide, please. About trauma and healthcare. If we could have the next slide. If um, all of our work, whether it is speaking to health professionals, speaking to children, um, looking at the research and evidence has pointed towards trauma and how trauma can be an unintended consequence of healthcare. Because for children, uh, often when they go into hospital, they will be scared, anxious, and aware of what's going to happen and distressed. And if nothing is done to alleviate that, hospital admission can lead to chronic anxiety in children and other uh, have other mental health effects. Um, and we know the longer children are unwell, the longer their exposure to ne negative experiences, these prolonged and repeated periods of hospitalization and treatment can increase a child's risk of trauma. And I've got a quote here, and that's from a young person who said, I feel scared and no one understands me. And this is a young person who hasn't just entered the healthcare system. This is a young person that's had prolonged treatment uh, in healthcare and has gone to hospital repeated times and they are just about to transition into adult services. And this is the legacy they're left with. So if we could have the next slide, please. And some people might be, oh, these are very exceptional circumstances. This happens to maybe children who have like complex uh, illnesses or conditions. For what uh, I would say, there's over 80,000 children, young people in the UK who have life limiting conditions, for example. So it's not a small group of children. But we decided to put it to the test and ask the general public um, whether this applies to them. And so we commissioned YouGov to uh, run a poll with 2,000 adults representative of the UK population and 1,000 children who are also representative of the UK population uh, and ask them about their experiences of visiting the doctor or hospital. 
and over half of those children said that they're worried or scared of visiting the doctor or hospital. Over half of those children are at risk of developing trauma if nothing's done to alleviate those uh, feelings of worry and, and distress. And nearly one in 10 adults said their childhood experiences of healthcare have negatively impacted on their mental health and well-being. If we were to generalize this to the UK wide population, that's 4.8 million adults in the UK who are experiencing trauma or at risk of trauma related to the healthcare. And what was interesting, a smaller sample uh, were, was able to uh, remember whether they played or not at the doctors or in hospital. And of those who remembered, they were more likely to be happy or calm when visiting as a child or as an adult. Could you have the next slide, please? For those who have heard me speak before, you might be well acquainted with this slide. Um, we feel that play is one of the answers. Um, we uh, when children play, uh, we enable them to have a more positive experience of hospital and it's a fun place to be. And we, we see this through the feedback we receive from our services and observing that in practice, but it's also in the literature as well. Because they're having fun and they have a more positive experience, this reduces their fear, their anxiety, their distress about being in hospital. And in some cases, uh, it even reduces the uh, child's perception of pain associated with treatment, which in turn can reduce the need for sedation, for example. And this can lead to better engagement with treatment, which leads to efficiencies for the NHS as well. And if you're interested in that work, I'm going to ask Sarah if she minds putting a link to our, an evaluation that Pro Bono Economics did for us on some of our services that showed that when children are playing, this can reduce the length of time they need to be in healthcare and also the need for sedation in some cases. Um, and this uh, impact doesn't just extend to the children, although Play and playing can help increase resilience and coping with treatment. It gives a child a sense of control when everything else is uncertain. But it also has that impact for the wider family and for parents. And so I'm going to be showing a short video. It is one of our fundraising videos, so we will be talking about donating. But the reason why I'm showing that is to show the parent's story about their experience of uh, accessing play and the impact that it had. However, if you do wish to donate, please do. I'm not going to say no, <laughs> uh, but that's not the reason why I'm showing this video. So if you can have the next slide and the video, please. Thank you. Next slide, please. So what this um, video also powerfully illustrated is that central to play in healthcare is the play team and how important our play specialists are in providing that clinical support to safeguard children's emotional mental health during treatment and procedures. But also the play workers who develop those wider opportunities for children to play in those settings and youth workers who work with children, with young people and adolescents and provide that specialist support for them. Without them, it would be difficult to integrate play into healthcare in an effective and efficient manner that is meaningful. Could I have the next slide, please? And to illustrate that is um, Claire, who featured in the previous video, and we're going to show her perspective um, 
this is also a fundraising video. If you want to donate, great, but this is not the purposes why I'm showing this video. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Oh, sorry, I actually forgot that I'm not controlling the slides. Uh, <laughs> oh. Um, so, in addition to obviously um, the the evidence, um, what Starlight has observed, but also, well, I'm sure that all of the play, uh, professionals and all of the health professionals in this uh, webinar have observed uh, about the power of play. It also features in guidance, and I think it's important to remember that. So the National Service Framework talks about it being recommended that all children staying in hospital have daily access to a play specialist. And NICE guidance talks about how play, the power of play can be used to reduce the fear and anxiety about pain. And so even though the evidence is there, the guidance is there to emphasise the importance of play in these settings. However, what we're finding and research that we have done has shown is that we're falling far from being able to achieve this ideal. And so next slide, please. Um, we um undertook an exercise to assess the state of play in healthcare and the extent to which um we are delivering opportunities for children to play in healthcare and particularly in hospital can we have the next slide and so in the last year we issued 160 foi requests to all acute trusts and health boards in the uk um, we had a response of 140 of those trusts and health boards, and we asked them about things like admissions, uh, the number of play staff, the salary banding, you know, the budget that they have for play and what play provisions they have, and so forth. Um, because um, the quality of the data varied when we received it, we've supplemented some of this data with NHS digital data and the Scottish Government data, so people have heard me talk about um, this FOI exercise before. What we've done in this report is supplemented that, that some of that data, so it'll be slightly different. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, in terms of what we found uh, in those 140 trusts and health boards, there are 1,156 play professionals of which only 571 are registered health play specialists. Now, it's important to note there are over 600 registered health play specialists in the UK. However, in these uh, acute trust and health boards, there were 571. Um, and 47% of these health play specialists work part-time. So actually the figure of a full-time equivalent, not including weekends, would be just over 400, about 437. And um, we also know in those settings that only 35% said that they did provide weekend cover and a further 1% said they did it sometimes. Next slide, please. There's also just over 1.7 million hospital admissions. This was for financial year 21-22 um, in the UK. And that would mean 
if we were going to look at the full time equivalent of those health play specialists, uh, that they would be responsible for 4000 child admissions per year. That's just the admissions. We don't even know how long the child is going to be staying in those settings for. Um, and that works out at about 70, just over 70 uh, admissions per week. Um, if they were to work every day, that would be 10 per day. But although it might be possible for each one of those children to have access to that play specialist, whether they can really provide meaningful um, therapeutic play in that period of time, stretched across all those uh, children, it would be quite difficult. If you go to the next slide, please. Not just that, but 71% of those trusts and health boards said they have no designated budget for play resources. Um, and although some of them might have access to a centralized budget or might fundraise and so forth, the majority of them actually have access to Starlight Health Play Services. And if they didn't have access to that, um, as Claire mentioned in the video, they wouldn't have access to play services. So not only are they stretched across different children, they don't have anything to give them to play with or, to, or any means to integrate play. Uh, um, next slide, please. But what was really interesting is we also asked about policies and procedures, and only 15% talked about that. And a lot of them talked about NAPS and HIPSET guidance. Um, and I found this interesting because in a hospital setting, most things have standard operating procedures from washing your hands and all those kind of things. But actually, there weren't policies or standards for play within those settings. And we have been working to address that. Um, we have been working with NHS England and we had a task force for the standards of play. And we published a report last week and Sarah is going to be sharing uh, uh, the report with the outcomes. And we had a webinar last week as well. So I would recommend looking uh, seeing that webinar if you haven't seen it already. Um, but other than that, there really isn't any standards for play. So next slide, please. Um, so I hope it, uh, we leave you with this. Children have said that hospital is scary. And if they continue to be scared and anxious and distressed about going to hospital, that can lead to trauma. But they've also said that play makes it better. So I I know I shamelessly showed two fundraising videos where he told you how to donate to us, but actually what we're asking is for the government, the health service and society at large to respond to the evidence that play and the clinical support of play specialists should be integral to children's health care and treatment. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, that was just the key highlights from uh, a report, as I said, um, that's been launched today and is available on our website. So please take take some time after the webinar to review the report and which will give you a lot more detail. I want to now um, introduce Dr. Alison Tonkin, um, who is from Stanmore College and um, I could say a lot about Alison, but actually, because of time, I'm going to say the most important thing, which is that Alison has recently published a book, which I'm sure you will all be interested in. And it's called Play in and Health in Childhood, a rights based approach. And it's been co-edited with um, Julia Whittaker. And it's a great read. So please do um, read Alison's book. And um, this is not a pitch for Alison, but Alison, inviting you to share your reflections about the report that's been launched today, please. Okay. Thank you very much for that introduction. That's very kind of you to plug our new book. <laughs> not the purpose, but there you go. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say was that I'm going to go back to 2014 and a piece of work that I did um, as a result of an invitation to NAPS by CAF. So it's a very fortunate coincidence that we're here together. So CAF asked NAPS to provide a report on, um, well, it was for uh, the start of play in hospital week back in 2014. And um, it was also to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the UNCRC. 
And Kath gave a brief and I said, yes, please, I'd love to do that. Thank you very much. And um, and then I found the brief. And the first thing on the brief was evidence. And my heart sank because I knew there wasn't any. So um, uh, with a little bit of fiddling around, we, we came up with a rather, rather nice lit review. Thank you very much, Kath, um, for being so uh, flexible in terms of what we could do. Um, but one of the things that came out was back in 2010, the Kennedy Review said uh, the contribution of play provision to the clinical outcome is hard to measure, which means that uh, one of the problems is with play, if it's true play, is that its outcome cannot be measured. And certainly not when you put it in competition with a, a clinical outcome that's got to happen anyway. So the role of play um, Everyone knows how important play is, but that evidence base is absolutely crucial. And so to have Starlight come along and produce wonderful reports like this is absolutely essential because it's got the quantitative data that um, commissioners are going to be looking at. So um, for them to be able to produce the report has been uh, excellent. Um, in terms of the report, I'm going to go down the line of storytelling with data because that's what it's done. So um, if you're going to do that, there's three components for your story. And the first one is to grab. And that's what the report has done with all its information about trauma and the impact of trauma that it has on children and young people. And also that lifelong approach in terms of the uh, impact it has on adults as well. And that's really important for someone who's terrified of going to the dentist due to uh, childhood experiences. So um, it was really important that you had trauma there to start with. And then what you did is you very cleverly went on to reducing trauma through play. So that's that's the first part of the story. The second part of the story is called guts. And that's where you've got all your information and all your lovely data, which gives you uh, a really solid overview in terms of the importance of play for reducing trauma. Um, and then the final bit of the story component is the gotcha. So hopefully by that point, most people will have thought, yeah, this is really, really important. And play is so important for lots and lots of different reasons. And it's good to see that the theme this year in terms of reducing trauma has got a solid message that can actually influence, hopefully, policymakers. Now you've got your evidence. Hopefully that will be a, a good move into actually fulfilling children's rights for both Article 24, which is the right to the best possible health, and also Article 31 for rest, relaxation and uh, play. And so I'm going to finish off this little bit by just saying uh, a couple of quotes from uh, Tableau. They, they do some fantastic stuff on storytelling data. And the first one is stories provide the connecting structure between facts. And you did that also with some of your case studies in this presentation here. And then the final one is uh, when done thoughtfully, a story with data can change the way we see the world, creating conviction that may even call us to action. So thank you. Lovely report. Really, really enjoyed it. Fantastic evidence base. Alison, thank you so much. That was fascinating. And I will come back to some of what you've said at the end of the webinar. Um, I now want to introduce um, Kath Evans, who is um, the Director of Children's Nursing at Bath Health. And I think it's fair to say that Kath has been a long standing supporter, critical friend of Starlight and has helped us and guided us in um, over quite a long period of time. Um, Kath, I would like to invite you for your reflections, please, on the report. Oh, thanks ever so much. And I feel very honoured to have been asked to, to reflect on the, on the report. Importantly, I want to say thank you. It's incredibly helpful when an external organisation works in partnership, hand in hand, with the NHS. And that's exactly what you've done through this freedom of information request. You've really 
try to get us as NHS organisations to respond and to engage in this process. So it's absolutely come across that you have built that evidence base um, from across the country, not just from England. So importantly, I do just want to say thank you, because I think all of us that work in the NHS, and I know that there are many, many wonderful colleagues on um, the call. I can see that Ruby is here, one of the awesome play specialists out in Eastern North Hertfordshire, for example. Everyone wants to do the very best they can for the babies, children and young people that they care for. But you know what? Sometimes we need a bit of help and we need this evidence base. We need to be able to take our chief executives, our executive teams, our non-executive directors by the hand and show them the difference that play makes in a neonatal unit, in the A&E department. And I can already see that some colleagues on the call are actually joining from busy ED departments at the moment, really stretched to be supporting play as well as listening to growing the evidence base and really understanding the research that's been provided to, um, today. But we also know that there are many, many more opportunities. Play isn't just about inpatient care. It's also about community support as well. I will never forget one of my very senior children's nurses saying to me, all a little boy on a ventilator wants to do is go outside into the playground and see other children playing. And her absolute mission was to get a portable ventilator so that she could absolutely do that. And that was done in partnership with a brilliant play team. So I think as Alison's reflected so wonderfully, those articles, Article 24, Article 31, are our absolute foundations as we go forward. We've had an awful lot of reports. The National Service Framework for Children and Young People in Hospitals, the Care Quality Commission absolutely state the importance of play. And then more recently, we've had the nice babies, children and young people experience of care guidance. There's an awful lot of guidance out there. But now, as has already been highlighted, we've got some really clear data and a really clear call to action that despite all of our efforts, we're not there yet. This is going to need all of us to act as advocates and ongoing champions for play with our babies, children, young people and their families and absolutely vitally to make sure that those quieter voices, those who might be seldom heard, are absolutely championed as we go forward as well. So I think that this report is incredibly helpful. It integrates yet again mental, emotional and physical care and really highlights the importance of play in making a difference, not just to the here and now, but for children's health and adult health and to their future children's health by getting this right. Thank you for an opportunity to reflect. Kath, thank you very much for very, very powerful reflections on such a wide range of, of the impact of, of, um, of, of the report that's been published today. Um, so thank you very much, Sandy and Alison and Kath. So a lot for all of us to consider and think about. We now have a good amount of time, nearly half an hour, for any questions, any comments, any observations. So I just want to open up the floor. You can put something in the chat. Um, you can put your hand up. Um, I can see there is one question in the chat from Nikki Smith at Oxford. D 
do your figures include all play team members or just those that are qualified health play specialists? I think this is for Sandy. So um, in the 1,156 figure, that's all play team members. So that includes play workers, uh, team leads, um, even uh, we've heard from uh, about play therapists and play health play specialist students and other volunteers as well. There is a hand up from Sharon Justice at Lewisham. Sharon, are you there? Please ask your question from Lewisham and Greenwich NHS Trust. Sharon, are you there? It might be a mistake. Maybe you've had to move on. Any any other questions or comments that anybody's got from anything you've heard um, to the panel, to, to Alison, to Kath, uh, to Sandy? Sharon, you're still welcome to ask your question. Your hand is still up. OK. I, I'm just going to um, reflect back a little bit <clears throat> from something that Alison, you were saying about storytelling with data. And I'm, I was just so happy to hear you say that because it's almost like you've picked up something that we've been talking about internally in our meetings about what's the best way of presenting something like this. And of course, you know, the, the most powerful narrative is the story. That is the way that we can communicate and get the message across. But of course, what we're trying to do very importantly, and the gap that Starlight has identified is around evidence. You know, it's it's about that's where we can actually persuade and cajole and nudge the key decision makers is through sharing the evidence, as Kath was saying. What can we show them? So we finally have some evidence after a really detailed piece of work that Sandy and her team have undertaken. And I, I was just thinking in terms of an open question to um, anybody on, 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 on um, this webinar is how can you see yourself using some of this evidence? Can you see yourself actually discussing it in your team meeting, sharing it with your managers? Or is this something that could help help you? In, in sharing um, the report and the findings of that report. Is, th is this evidence useful to you on the ground, really? It's the question that I want to ask um, everybody who's he's here today. There's quite a lot of comments in the chat, Kritika, as well. Great, thank you. I've been looking at the names now, so OK. So I'm going... Um, would you say the report is relevant to advocate for the importance of playing a children's hospice? That's a question from Nancy. And I would say that it definitely is really, really strong and powerful to use in hospices. But Sandy um, and Alison and Kath, do any of you want to comment on that? And so it's a comment from Nancy. I'll I'll start if and then. Uh, so uh, we did actually issue a survey as well uh, to hospices, and I think someone also asked about community settings. So we did issue an FOI request to them. This report has focused mainly on acute, but we will be publishing other evidence for those settings. But I would say definitely um it's so important in a hospice setting we can see it from the feedback we receive uh, from families we actually have um a, a health play specialist a health uh, play worker placed in a hospice um as we speak and we can really see from evaluating that uh, provision that it has such a tremendous impact on children their mental health and their well-being in that setting as well as the family Alison or Kath, do you want to respond to that at all? Um, go on, Kath. I, I was just going to say, I, I totally agree with um, Sandy, and I suspect everyone on the call will be saying, 
Absolutely. The importance of play, whether it be in children's ongoing health care, whether it be at end of life and palliative care is absolutely essential. But I also want to say that play is essential within neonatal services as well. And that's still a bit of a gap where we haven't got some consistency as well. And I've just been on a wonderful vaccination and immunisation call this morning. And we know that we've got big issues with regard to vaccination uptake where we have seen phenomenal impact is with the support of Starlight in terms of bringing play into primary care settings as well. So they've absolutely smashed their targets on flu vaccination this weekend over in City and Hackney because they've been running Disney princess parties and superhero parties where they've absolutely integrated play and fun into childhood immunisation. So I think there are so many boundaries that can significantly be advanced when we think creatively as well. So not just hospice care, but, you know, let's get play integrated in all healthcare settings. And I'm just going to give a bit of a shout out for mental health settings as well. It's not just about occupational therapy. It's not just about music therapy. We absolutely need our play specialists and play being championed in all children's mental health settings consistently as well as we go forward. Thank you, Kath. Alison, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I was just going to add that uh, one of the strengths of the report is it doesn't just talk about play specialists. It talks about yeah. the play team. So uh, you've got your youth workers, you've got your play workers and you've got your play specialists. Um, but it also um, it can also be used with our nursing staff as well, um, particularly since you've highlighted within the report that um, what was about 47 percent. Um, during the sort of nine to five, whereas maybe at weekends um, when children and young people and, and babies and neonates also and the fair families also need support um, from play services. So the more we can spread the word through wonderful reports like this, the better. Brilliant. Thank you, Alison. I'm just going to read out a couple of things from the chat and then I'm going to invite Irene. Um, a message from... It's just as I was about to read it, there's lots of other messages came. So message from um, Amanda Williamson. This report is fantastic. And I hope this results in policies in the future. That is nationwide. How long before we can see action from the government? Um, well, I'd like to say that we're working very closely with the NHS England. Many of you will know that we are really on the case. And, you know, I think as um, Kath, said we all need to be advocates and champions here in our own different roles in our own different ways we all need to be shouting about the value and the importance and the impact of play um for children and babies and young people through their health journeys um another comment reiterate thanks to starlight for having our backs and fighting for the recognition and the benefit of play and the work of the play team, especially when we can often feel like we have a solo voice within the healthcare setting, long overdue time and time for a change in the culture for the NHS, national changes to ensure equity is ser service delivery across the country. I'm going to ask Irene, please, for comments, observations, Irene. Thank you, Kritika. And um, so apologies, I've, I missed most of the presentation because I was travelling back on the Northern Line from a hospice um, at the start of National Plain Hospital Week to represent NAPS to be there for the launch. Um, and that's why I wanted to come in. But I, so I firstly want to say I will watch this on catch up. Um, but a really huge congratulations to everybody that's been involved in this report. This is exciting, powerful, momentous, it's it's fantastic. And I, you know, just echo what everyone said that we are, you know, we're stronger together. I had that conversation with your lovely Natalie um, at the hospice this morning when we were talking about stuff. We have been able to achieve so much by working together in all the different roles. That's what the where the power lies. So, you know, really, really important to acknowledge that. 
Um, and I just wanted to say, having been to Noah's Ark Hospice this morning and listening to the play team, who are made up of a registered play specialist and wonderful play workers, so echoing Alison's point, you know, this is about the play teams and what those teams look like um, working forever, throughout the sort of neonate to sort of, you know, adolescent, young adult journey. Um, it was it was really humbling. They are supporting children, young people to live the fullest life that they can. And as we know that medical advances mean that lots of children, young people that would have maybe not lived as long as they did with life limiting conditions are, that's more important than ever. And that, you know, healthcare will be delivered in your home or in primary care or in a hospice setting. And so, yeah, absolutely 1000 million percent play um and this report should be supporting hospices community wherever wherever those children young people and those families are so um so naps were absolutely delighted that um this could be launched for the first time in a hospice setting i think that's really major progress and really important for our profession to know that we are fully inclusive thank you irene thank you for your kind kind comments um before i invite nicola i um, just going to read out one comment from the chat um, from Alison Granger saying I'm a student and we all understand the importance of health place specialists, but there is a massive struggle to find registered mentors in the southwest to be able to complete their degree. And this is, you know, this is um, an ongoing problem. We are all aware that this is a real issue and I know Irene, in, in in your other work that, you know, and, and, and the work stream, the workforce work stream of, of the task force is really looking into that. I know that there are some progress has been made, but there is some way to go still on this issue. And we are very, very aware um, um, of the difficulties that students face in this area. I want to invite Nicola Binks, please, for your comments, observations, please. Yeah, just a couple of things. How can we encourage our trust to put uh, HPSCs out into the community? That's one point, because um, we don't have that. And we've had many of our oncology families asking for more support um, because we as a, um, like they have it in their tertiary and then we don't have it when they come to us, but they could do with more in the community. Um, and as our uh, uh, my uh, MID doesn't do that. And the other one is how can we support the uh, uh, the increase on the mental health of children and their families that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you like to comment on that, please? Do you want me to come in with that? With that yes, please, if you, yeah, yeah. And, and then Laura. Yeah, Kath and then Laura smashing laura i don't mean to jump in but nicola what what brilliant questions and i think it's something that we're all grappling with in terms of how really how do we actually grow this play presence within community settings because i think that continuity of care element is also a significant challenge for us as well particularly children who are on you know long-term pathways of care really build those relationships and it can be hugely valuable one of the things that I know makes a real difference is the voice of the child and the voice of families. And if we can capture that, whether it actually be by a letter or those experiences from families via a survey or capturing that narrative, that can be really, really powerful. So alongside data, capturing that narrative and, and also trying to bring that child's experience to life for those people that may well be involved in business planning processes as well. So really building up your allies is absolutely essential when we're thinking about any element of service delivery. So my, my key tips would be, can you capture those narratives, those voices from children and families directly? And who are your allies? Who can you actually count on? Is it senior managers? Is it consultants? Is it a non-executive director to really work with you to think creatively about how this service actually ex expands going forward? With regard to mental health, I know that we've got significant opportunities there as well. One of the things that I'm really keen that we actually encourage from a nursing perspective is dual registration as well. And I think we can all be increasing our knowledge 
about mental health and better support and whether it's interventions such as We Can Talk, which is a phenomenal programme to help us build our confidence in really engaging effectively and better supporting our young people in mental health crisis or whether it be formal programmes. I think there's much more that we can be doing there, but I don't think that we should be scared of it. Our young people need us to connect, need us to be empathetic and need us to challenge the system as well. And again, I think that's where the power of the voice of young people and of their families and also allies going forward will help us progress this mental health agenda um, further, Nicola. Sorry to have jumped in, Laura, forgive me. Thank you so much, Kath. Uh, Laura and then Sandy. That's brilliant. Thank, thanks so much, um, Kritika, and th thanks, Kath. All of that is is brilliant. I really, what you're saying about mental health really resonates with me. The reason I put my hand up was actually about the um, the to respond to the the issue of persuading on the importance of community uh, provision, and I think you know so many people on the call will know the pressures and the the sort of capacity issues that there are when you're inside a setting and how impossible it, it feels to with that capacity do bridge that that gap and go out into the community um and so instead of taking that responsibility finding additional resource is where it's at i just wanted to say when we're, we're not quite there yet but but starlight over the last year we're coming to the end of the first year of our funded uh, play posts um, and we're working with Leeds Beckett University to be able to really tell the story of the importance of having uh, play specialists in the, in this case and uh, yeah play specialists working both in palliative care and in um, attached to a hospital um, the the value of that and so really I would um, I'm very excited for um, for that information to come out. And I know that as a team, we've all been really busy trying to make sure that we're articulating exactly what's needed. So hopefully that would be a, a, a piece of persuasive literature that could help. So watch this space. Thank you, Laura. Um, Sandy. Absolutely. And, and just to add to that, we also issued an FOI request, as I said, to community uh, trusts and mental health trusts, and we're still sorting out the data with that. So hopefully we will be able to give you, in addition to the evidence that we're collecting from the evaluation of our services, um, data to supplement similar to what we produced in this report uh the evidence that you need to make that case that there's more that is needed in community settings and mental health settings in terms of of play um i just also want to add there was a comment about article 12 in the comments and you also touched upon uh, children and young people's participation which is so important and we have been doing some activities with different healthcare settings about how to make things more participatory i would recommend watching that webinar and if you want to have further discussions about how to integrate participation into your work, please do get in touch with us and we would love to have a chat. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. I think that's such a salutary reminder is it, children need to be at the heart of this and we need to be listening all the time. And the voice of the child is so critical um, to all our work. And certainly at Starlight, it's something that we are working very hard on. We recognise that in the past, we haven't done as much as we could have done and should have done. So Sandy's leading on a piece of work, which is really about making sure that we have a standing group of children, young people that we are listening to on a regular basis and we're supporting them so that there is participation and co-production are not done on the edges of things that are at the heart of the way we operate, the way we plan our service delivery and our other planning in, in the organisation. So a really important part of all of our work. Um, I wanted to just read one um, comment from the chat from um, Savitri Fernandez at Lewisham. And, you know, she's mentioning about funding, which is a continuing problem in this area. Our struggle is funding, having a battle. We rely heavily on Starlight and sometimes feel play is not seen as important as it should be. 
um, and wish the help play specialist course could be done online. But as part of the information and the data that Sandy presented today, is that so many settings just don't have any funds. You know, and, and they are trying to raise funds, you know, um, on their own. And many of you will be doing that. And we really want to be advocating um, with the key decision makers, whether they be commissioners, NHS England. And we want to empower you with information and data so you can be also be doing that, that, you know, this is not a nice to have. This is a, a critical part of, of children's rights and as part of their health journey. and. While funding challenges remain, we are all going to need to be the advocates and have good quality data behind us when we talk to the key decision makers. And I would really encourage all of you, um, you know, to be doing that and, and build your alliances, whether locally or nationally, um, and, and, and really use the evidence that we are able to share, not just from Starlight, from across the piece, um to to advocate for additional funding for this really important important work um i want to invite joanna heath please to comment joanna we can't hear you you're on mute sorry um yeah i've just got three things i wanted to say very quickly I'm from the Children's Heart Federation, so uh, we work with children with heart conditions and their families. So first, just to say that I don't know whether you're aware, but we we um, produce some resources for children with heart conditions. One of which is is a, we call it a Molly's dolly, and it's a rag doll that um, we match the scars that the child has, and um, they're available free of charge to any child who has a heart condition. Um, as long as they're uh, recommended by a healthcare professional. And we would include a place specialist in that. I can put details about that in the chat. And we also produce a couple of little books about going into hospital, um, having a heart condition, one for very, very young children um, and one for sort of key stage two age groups. So I can put details about that. Secondly, I just want to say that if it would be helpful, I can ask our families if they can report back with positive experiences of um of play in hospital and elsewhere uh, and equally if there's any gaps where they think it would have been valuable but it wasn't available uh, and, and thirdly this is a bit more as a lay person but i'm sure it impacts on our children as well when i've i, I just wonder because when i've been to the hospital and had blood tests I would say every time I've gone, there's been a child there who has been really, really distressed. And I, I just wondered, is that do you do some hospitals have a play therapist available there to help? And it just seems um, I'm just interested, really, because it just seems like something that I really think would would be helpful. And I'm sure it affects. I know a lot of our children you know, have needle phobias after going having an operation or something. And I'm sure that when they go back for blood tests, you know, similar things happen. Thank, Thank you, you, Joanna. Thank you. Anybody want to respond, comments to that? I think, Joanna, one of the key things that Sandy was able to share is that there just aren't enough members of the play team available across the UK. And I think that's it's just as it's almost as simple as that. That's, you know, in terms of why uh, children are not getting the, the support um, that they need, um, because there aren't enough bodies in the system to do this really important work. And that's one of the key uh, calls for action that we have. And that's one of the reasons why we undertook this FOI exercise to demonstrate what many of us know on the ground that there are there are not enough members of the play team to support all the children uh, um, who have a right to this support. They just aren't there, um, and I suspect that's probably why you are you are observing what you did um, in terms of the lack of support that children have. Uh, I'm conscious that we've got three minutes left. 
Um, any comments, any last observations from anyone? Um, some, some really lovely messages from Paul Harris. A big thanks to Starlight and everyone involved in producing this report. As play staff, it's vitally important for all of us to be advocates for play, and the data in this report will be an important tool in helping us to do this. So that's really great. Um, Nicola, is that a, a new hand up? Yes, just going back to data. Um, will the can we clarify the data to what we would how many HPSCs or uh, uh, play assistants we could have within uh, the settings? Is there any room for that within the data quality that is uh, being gathered? In in terms of what the ideal should be. Um, yeah. Because obviously, um, you know, We've done some internal kind of review and discussions. I'm not going to share that here because we haven't come to a conclusion, so I don't want to be quote a figure. <laughs> but um, at the moment, we are in different talks with um, different stakeholders in, in government to look at what it would look like if we had to fully okay. resource the NHS stuff. So hopefully in, in due course, we will be able to share that. But it's hard to tell, to be honest, because we have nothing to uh, uh, not enough evidence to base that on and what the ideal would look like because it would be very relative in what setting you're in and, and things like that so to go to lead with like every setting should have x number of play specialist play workers um it is it, quite difficult to come to that figure but we are in the process of advocating for one but what i would say it has to be relative to your setting what the needs are for your particular setting yeah but would you then okay. say that you would have say specialist for, I don't know, for when the onco like oncology children or, you know, if you've just got a general medical surgical ward like I have, and then we've got a day surgery that has one, one specialist, you know, in my ward, there's just me as one qualified and one unqualified at present, you know, and that's not sufficient. I'm on, bur I've burnt out at the moment. I'm off sick because I cannot do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's also an important story to tell. Um, but I would say, yeah. There are ways to calculate that, but maybe we can have an, a discussion offline sure. about yeah, sure. your experience. <laughs> no worries. Last comment to Kath Evans before we close the webinar. You know, I'm just reflecting that there's a lovely quote from uh, Maya Anglo that says, do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. I think this evidence that you shared with us today gives us that baseline. We know where we are, we know that mm. we can do better, and we've now all got an opportunity to share this report and to keep on championing and using every possible lever we can to consistently ensure that every child has a right to play when they are being exposed and when they are part of a healthcare intervention. So I think we've got some real opportunities thanks to the work that you've undertaken at Starlight. So I do want to say thank you very, very much indeed. That's a lovely quote to end on, Kath. Thank you so much. What a perfect end to the webinar. And um, I want to say a very big thank you to Alison and Kath and Sandy uh, for your contributions. A really, really interesting um, uh, comments in the chat to all of you for taking the time out from your busy schedules to attend this webinar, to share your thoughts. Um, and I hope that you will look at other webinars if they're all available on our website. If you miss any, please review them and please, please look at the report. Give us your comments. You know, you know where we are. So if there's anything that you read that you, you know, share your comments and continue to be good friends of Starlight and be advocates for the children that we're all here to support. Um, and have a good rest of the day. And thank you, Sarah, for making sure that all of this works smoothly, because without that, nothing works. So thank you so much, Sarah, for your support as well. Thank you all and see you all soon. Bye bye.